How has the world for all of us changed when it comes to computing, when it comes to the cloud, when it comes to interconnectivity because of this pandemic? Hi, David. First, it's, it's great to be here and to talk to your audience. Uh, when we look at the pandemic and what's unfolding upon us, first, let's just have a lot of sympathy for those who are impacted by it. But then, as you've all shifted to remote work, the need for digital technologies, the need for cloud, the need for AI has accelerated. As you pointed out, our audience went from 30,000 to 87,000. I do believe that's a reflection of the acceleration that our clients are seeing in adopting these technologies. If we look at cloud, it's a great way to be able to reach your clients virtually, to be able to get all your employees connected back to the enterprise in a remote and virtual way. If you look at AI, it's about the only way to get the extreme automation to be able to handle the workloads that are going to be thrust upon us. And that's why we're making so many announcements at this conference in both those realms, as well as the client interest that we can see with the, with the people who are attending these sessions remotely. So let's talk about those clients because you talk to them every day. We've all become so dependent on this technology. What are the things you're hearing most from your clients about what they need, what changes they need, what improvements they need, and what are you trying to do to address those? Uh, so, so a couple, uh, David, just to make a point, uh, this thing. So I'll be talking to the chief digital officer for Anthem during the conference. And what they're talking about is how do they connect all their, uh, their clients, the 40 million people who get healthcare, and how can they connect with them uh, digitally and remotely? And how can they infuse those experiences with AI? And how can they build them on a hybrid cloud platform so they can run them at scale and dial them up and down depending upon the need? So that's a great example of a client, but it's the same story we hear from everywhere, whether from people in the airline industry, uh, insurance, banking, telecom, it's about bringing hybrid cloud technologies so they can deploy the workload wherever it's, uh, it's fit for purpose. And then they can use AI to not only do extreme automation, which helps take cost out, but to actually make uh, the experience even richer for all their end clients. And that's why we begin to see the infusion of both those technologies going forward. A quick example, one of the products we'll announce here is in the category we call AI for IT. And the product is called Watson AI Ops. Outages in IT cost the industry about $265 billion. But that's, if we react after the fact, that cost is still there. If we can begin to predict what may go wrong and be able to put it right in the workflow, right in all the collaboration tools and fix it even before it happens, that brings huge power, unlocking the potential of AI for our clients. And that is something we really, really are excited about in addition to the other hybrid cloud technology we're also bringing out at this conference. So, so Arvind, I must say, those of us who are working from home and experience some of the glitches that happen are eager to have those corrected. When will that product be available? Will it really redeem some of the situations that we have where our system goes down? There's some problem, we have to reboot it, things like that. Uh, so that product actually is, is coming out now. We're announcing it at the conference in May and people can start purchasing it now for deployment in this quarter, meaning before, before the month of June. So that is a great, great power. But to talk a little bit more on AI, if you look at AI and its impact on COVID, something we're all unfortunately uh, suffering from right now, when I look at medical research in India, I look at government services in Poland, I look at hospitals in the United States, and these examples go across dozens of countries, we can all begin to use intelligent AI assistance to really take away and triage out a lot of uh, information that people are looking for. So in a hospital case, uh, parents who are anxious about their children can interact with the AI assistant and, be, and that way you can take a thousand odd calls and take them out of the medical professional's hands, allowing the medical professionals to focus on the much more serious cases where the AI reacts with, hey, this is serious enough that you should actually have a person now interact. I think these are really useful examples to show how AI can go, not just in IT, as you pointed out, David, where we all would like all of our infrastructure to stay up all the time, and we do believe the tools in, in the next month are going to help there, but also in terms of helping our citizens and governments and medical professionals be able to help uh, everyone deal with COVID-19. 
So, Arvind, you make a very important point there, mentioning various countries where this could be applied. Uh, the situation has been global when it comes to Internet and digital. At the same time, even before the pandemic, there were some countries that are trying to draw some borders when it came to data, uh, when it came to some of the Internet's issues. Are you concerned, do you see any indications that the pandemic problems that we're seeing may actually increase the resistance to flows of data and information across borders? Look, David, um, I'll, I'll sort of begin with my perspective. Um, of course, economies are always going to, and nations are always going to try to advantage themselves. But when we step back, I think both global trade and the free flow of data have shown that the entire economy, the global economy gets better and everyone benefits. I think it's a false dilemma when people think about a win-lose. It's not a sports game where it's a win-lose. It's a win-win if we can increase the size of the pie for everyone. Now, I'll acknowledge that should come with regulations, that should come with protections around IP, but the free flow of goods and the free flow of data is what unlocks the potential of all of this for everyone. And if you look right now, actually in the pandemic, I'm encouraged that people are more, are cooperating more. People are taking advantage of both cloud and computing capabilities from everywhere. The sharing of science research has increased. So there are some positive signs amongst all of the emotion that naturally in, uh, accompanies such a crisis. Arvind, that's one of the things we hear about, the cooperation even among competitors, because this is a true crisis. Is there any way to institutionalize that? Because there is a tendency for humans to respond to crises, but then when the crisis goes away, they go back to their own ways of doing business. So David, I think public-private partnerships have paid off so much, not just for the nation and for the government, but for private enterprise as well. I mean, if we look at the space program from the 60s, how many technologies came out of that, whether it's Teflon, whether it's fire redundant suits, whether it's the ballpoint pen, whether it's semiconductors, the integrated circuit. I think we can actually lay a lot of credit on that for the public-private partnerships created in the 60s. We can look upon the internet, if you look at the 80s and 90s, as another example which has benefited everyone. And one that we are particularly excited about in high-performance computing is the public-private partnership uh, sponsored by the White House, IBM, the National Labs, and many nations, which brings high-performance computing in favor of solving COVID-19. The High Performance uh, Consortia, 440 petaflops brought from different people in, uh, and being harnessed towards science. Now, that is uh, in the crisis, but that is an example of something which, if it continues, can lead to better drug discovery, could lead to better health care, can maybe work on climate and batteries, and many other things as those technologies, including quantum computing, begin to fold into those partnerships. I really am a believer that public-private can work together to actually be a win-win. It's, it's not a question of take from one to give to the other. And Ar Arvind, finally, uh, it strikes me that you're coming up on your one month anniversary as the CEO of IBM. Now, you were prepared. You came from IBM, you ran the cloud, you knew the company well. At the same time, this is a curveball that no CEO really could have anticipated. As you look back over that first month, what were the biggest surprises, biggest challenges that you found? Well, the biggest surprise for me is the extreme positivism and the way that every IBMer, or over 300,000 people around the globe, have risen to the challenge over 95% working from home, no client delivery missed, every deliverable met, people are really embracing this, including work from home pledges on how we all work together as a team. That's the real positivism. And I get the same reaction from so many of our clients also who are so appreciative of the work we do for them, both now and in the future. Now, th the surprise. Look, none of us can predict where this crisis is going to go. Certainly, I hope that its impact will be limited both in scale and uh, scope and time, but it could go on. And the surprise part is that we now have to plan for so many scenarios that were unforeseeable even three months ago. And that's sort of the negative side of it. But, but I'm an optimist. I do believe in the power of technology and in the power of innovation and actually in the spirit of capitalism to take us beyond this and to be able to lift us out and into a more positive future.